Okay, so last week, I think I tried to cram too much into one lecture. Um, so as you will have seen, the notes were, were very long and um, there's a lot of material from the notes that I did not manage to fit into the lecture. Um, I'm sorry about that, but uh, anyway, now I think having had such an intensive week last week, we can slow down a little bit now. Um, and we're going to address another topic, and this is something that could have been done much earlier in the course, um, but sort of because of where I want to take it, it seemed natural to leave it to, to now. Um, and this is to do with the, the very famous lemma from category theory. It's, um, you know, if, if you're asked to mention some, if you ask anyone who knows category theory to mention sort of a crucial lemma from category theory, they will mention this one, which is um, the Yaneda lemma. It's a very simple result in its own right, um, but it's very powerful in that it in, unlocks uh, somehow unlocks the key of a way to thinking that leads essentially to the development of a major mathematical topic subject which has applications in many areas and that sheaf theory um but today we'll mainly do the, the, the today we're not going to address sheaf theory that's more advanced um but we'll look at this yane dilemma which um essentially um enables enables sheaf theory to take place and I'm going to start from a very simple point of view, which is um, something we've, we've already looked at, um, but this is the distinction between the notion of global point and, sorry, between the, the notion of, yeah, a global point and a generalized point in a category. And this is one of the changes in perspective on mathematics. It's a very simple thing, but it's one of the changes of perspective on mathematics that um, is sort of core to the category theoretic way of looking at things. So the notion of a global point, um, a global point is a morphism from the terminal object to, to an object. And these things are, are very important in, say, the category of sets, the global points, because in set we have category of sets, um, objects, are determined by their global points. So objects are determined up to isomorphism by their global points. But this simply means that um, if you've got two objects, X and Y, and they have isomorphic sets of global points, so the global points of X are the morphisms from one to X, but of course, in sets, the morphisms from one to X tell us everything about X, so to speak, um, that's important mathematically, because the morphisms from one to X are the functions from singleton set to X, so they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with the elements of, of, of X, and for sets, the elements of a, of a set are all there is to a set, it doesn't have any additional mathematical structure. So it's basically a triviality, but if two objects, that's two sets X and Y, have isomorphic sets of global elements, then they are isomorphic objects. And of course, the other direction holds trivially too. So we've got that isomorphism of objects is the same thing as isomorphism of the global points. Um, but this, so, so the global points are from a terminal object into an object X. Sometimes you can generalize it to use instead of the terminal object, some unit for tensor product or some other canonical object that we use as the source, as a, the source for our points. But nonetheless, if you fix any object and look at morphisms from that object into X, in a general category, that's not going, whereas in category like sets, it does determine objects up to isomorphism. In a general category, this is not enough to determine objects up to isomorphism. So um, in a general category, this does not hold. Of 
course, in the general category, you replace subtier with the with the category itself. In the general category with the terminal object. So instead, we need to consider generalized points of X. But it does hold, but an analogous property holds. Sorry, that should be analogous. We consider generalized points. So, so this is what we've covered before, the generalized points of X are arrows sent to X. Where now we allow Z to range over any object in the category. So for Z ranging over so suppose our categories can be C, so as I ranging over the objects of C. And what we know from what we did in a long time ago when we looked at the home functor, this two this bifunctor as it's called functor in two arguments. One argument was contravariant, the other was with it was covariant, um, it's clear we can turn generalized points also into a functor. So we can think of generalized points form of X, let's say of X, form a contravariant functor. from inside. And this is something familiar to you, and one of the reasons that I set the first homework as it was, was to give you some familiarity with these kinds of functors. So this is this functor here, the contravariant functor, which goes from C of set. You've, you've already been working with this, so you know you know how it works. But uh, so the so so as Z goes to set of morphisms from Z to X, generalize those generalized points that have Z in the domain. The Z prime goes to those generalized points that have Z prime as domain. Actually, let's just put a single map here. This is how the, the action of the functor on morphisms. And as this was part of the um, of the first homework was dealing with these functors, the contravariant functor is if you've got a, a map. In that direction, it's a contravariant functor. So we get to a map down here, and it simply takes the morphism from Z to X and composes it with G. So to get a morphism from Z prime to X, they can write it very simply using this notation. Okay. So those are, so we view generalized points as a functor. And these functors are very important. So as I keep on saying, you were using them in the last question of the first homework, where I already introduced the terminology, and they're called representable functors. And this is the functor represented by the object X. So, 
So this contravariant functor is called the representable functor or the representable Prishi. Tell you what Prishi means later. Or X. And another notation is this is a, a lowercase y. Um, I'm underlining it because you would normally write it in bold. In bold, sorry, not bold. Um, bold is when you lose your hair. Um, bold is when bold is when it's written in a very strong way or in the brain. Um, anyway, so this is, and this little y here is because this is actually, we're going to see, we get this particular functor by applying another functor, the innator functor, which is why we call it y to x. But for the moment, we'll just consider this as a notation, but I mean, for a very short moment, we'll just consider this a notation as object. Oh, the, sorry, the, this has a notation for, for this functor. I'm not going to show you the functorial action of this in a moment. And we've got, we can already now state using this terminology, which is, sorry, using this machinery of these representable functors, which is already a little bit familiar to us, I'm going to state the right mathematical way of saying that objects are determined up to isomorphism by their generalized points in an arbitrary category. So let's call this proposition one. And let's draw it. So this is objects are determined by their generalized points. So that's the sort of slogan version of it. The, the mathematical way of saying this is that um, if the generalized points of X, so that's if they're isomorphic to the generalized points of Y, then X is isomorphic to Y. Uh, this is in category C. And this isomorphism, well, it's an isomorphism between two functors, because each of these is a functor, the representable functor. So it's an isomorphism in a functor category. So this is the functor category. Each one of these is a is a functor from it's a contravariant functor from C to set. So it's in that functor category. And once again, we can put this as an if and only if, but the right to left direction is not interesting. Okay, so that's the proposition. Now I'm not going to prove this now. I mean, it's it's not a difficult thing to prove. I'm not going to prove it now because it's going to be a corollary of the Yoneda lemma. So I'm going to tell you the Yoneda lemma, and then we'll derive this as a corollary of the Yoneda lemma. Actually, the way I'm going to get it is it's going to be a corollary of a corollary of the Yoneda lemma. So we'll first do a different, we'll do a different corollary, and then we'll get this as a corollary of the corollary. Okay, there's one little awkward thing to... to discuss, which I discussed in one way in the notes. Um, let me see what comes out in the lecture. I'm not, not quite... So I'm, I'm always a little bit unsure how best to deal with these issues. And this is the, the size problem. Um, because the idea that objects in general are determined by global points, that's, that, that's unproblematic, does not have any sort of size issues, so to speak. Um, well, you, you're dealing with home sets or home classes. 
Now we're dealing with, um, to, to talk about when they have isomorphic generalized points, so namely when the two representable functors are isomorphic, we're looking at a functor category from C op to set. You may remember that when the right-hand category of a functor category is not a small category, like set is, it's a locally small, but it's not a small category, then this functor category is also not a small, it's never a small category, unless this is the empty category. It's never a small category. It's locally small only in the case that, um, that the category C is itself small. But we somehow want to make sense of this also in the case of non-small categories C. Um, so what do we do? Well, so the above makes, makes uncontroversial sense. I'll just write makes sense easily if C is a small category. So if C is locally small, what happens is the status of this category becomes problematic. So C now has a, a class of objects and functors from the locally small category to set can be specified by arbitrary class functions between two classes. And it's you need a sort of superclass in order to get class functions. So what's problematic about this category is the collection of objects in the case that C is a locally small category. The collection of objects of this category has a problematic status. But given any two specified functors, the collection of natural transformations between them is, a, is just a class in the ordinary sense. Um, so, we, so actually, if you're given two specified objects, two specified functors, it's not problematic to make sense of the whole class those the, the class of all natural transformations between those functors. So in fact, one can still kind of, even though a functor category as a whole is problematic, the relevant part for, for this statement is not problematic in the case that C is not small, but locally small. Um, so having said that in words, and I think those words are expanded a bit in the lecture notes, um, So if, let's put it like this in, for, on the board. So if C is only locally small, then the collection of objects of this functor category, making sense of that is problematic. But, one can nonetheless make sense of the above proposition because it involves of the proposition because it involves only two objects. Only two specified objects. So I think that's as much as I want to say about this. So I'm going to make some assumptions about size sometimes, um, just in order that we don't need to worry too much about such things. This is the, the these size issues are really annoying in, in category theory. It's a, it's a shame. It sort of a little bit gets in the way of, of the subject. And, it's sort of very tempting, and that's kind of the way I'm going to do things, to ignore them as much as possible and just, just do the mathematics. And if you want to be careful, well, if you assume everything is small, if you assume the category C is small, then, then you're okay. If you're not working with a small category, you have to be careful, and then you need to think about what you're doing. We can discuss it more in the break, if we like. Um, well, let, yes. Uh, you wrote small in the second. It's locally small? Oh, yes. I did mean if it's only locally small. Otherwise, yeah. If it's small, everything's hunky dory. If it's only locally small, yeah. you have to you have to be 
You have to be careful. Um, so some people worry about how one could improve the usual foundations of mathematics so that one can do category theory in a way that's less um, polluted by such worried, problematic concerns about size. Um, anyway, uh, let's carry on. So we've got the proposition one, which now tells us that objects are determined by their generalized points, which holds in an arbitrary category. Much and everyone has to be careful with the formulation, with the interpretation of the statement in if it's not a small category. Um, and we're doing that by looking at generalized points using this representable. And the next observation I want to make is that these representables are actually given by a functor, the Tionada functor that I'm already using a notation for y, um, old y. So y is itself a functor, and this time a covariant functor. So we don't need to the opposite category in, taking us from category C to to the category of well, when we applied Y to an object text, we got a representable functor. So that has the main. So that, that's a functor from C up to set the representable functor, as we saw. So we go to a covariant functor to this functor category. So I'll write that down in a moment, but just to say last the last, well, I'm not, I'm not going to promise it's the last word, but um, so from now on, just to avoid worries, assume C is small. But some statement. Well, let me just put dot, dot, dot. But we're going to get to assume C is small, just in the same way that we had workarounds here. There are, for some things we say, there will be workarounds in the case that C is not small. But anyway, we'll, we'll just not worry about size anymore by working with a, a small C. Anyway, so then. So this is a covariant functor, and it's called the Unita functor. So this is why set goes from C to functor category C of the set. And the way this works, well, why? Y functor takes a map, let's call it G in C, and we need to go, we need to find a natural transformation that takes us from the representable for Y, well, so from the representable for X to the representable for Y. So how is this going to work? Well, we need to give the natural transformation its components. So on any object Z, we want the component for on, on Z for, for this. So y, y of X applied to Z, the Y of X is the generalized element functor. So Y of X applied to Z is the whole set from Z to X. So we need to take an element, let's call it F from the whole, what I call it F, yeah from the whole set then to X, and we need to map it to an element of the whole set from Z to Y. And of course, we can do that by composition, but simply F composed with G. Sorry, hang on. No, G composed with F. I put it the right way in the notes, yeah. Okay. And again, this is, now, 
I mean, what I wrote, what we've done so far was the sort of thing you were doing in the first homework. This is now, we didn't look explicitly at this functor in the first homework, um, but nonetheless, this kind of the way one's defining this functor is very familiar, so to speak, I mean, it's with, with composition. And in fact, I mean, it's familiar because another way of looking at this. Another way of looking at this is that we have the whole functor set. We have the whole functor. This was already in the second lecture, the third lecture. And um, category of categories. I, I should have told you this when we did Cartesian closing. I think I forgot to. The category of categories, cat, is itself a Cartesian closed category where the function space between two categories is the functor category between those categories. So if you remember Cartesian closeness, it gives us a a function space object or an exponential object, as I was, as I was calling them, between two objects. So if we now take the exponential object from the those corresponding to those morphisms from C to set, namely those functors from C to set, well, there is such an object in the category cat, which is the functor the functor category from so basically functor categories enjoy the universal property um enjoy the the universal property on let's let's put double arrow because it's natural transformations um enjoy the universal property of a function space from Cartesian closeness um and this so there's the one-to-one -one correspondence here, and the whole functor under this correspondence is in one-to-one. -one. The functor it gives us is the Unada functor here. So you can think about that in your own time. I mean, one can simply understand things in this way. Again, I was a little bit pipping to you in the way pipping is like the sort of small lies that children um, say. It's a little bit pipping to you in how I describe this, because it, it's true that the category of categories the category cat is Cartesian closed, but that's the category of small categories. That's a Cartesian closed category. Here I'm using set, and that's not a small category. So I'm not really working in the category cat of categories. Nonetheless, one could either think of this as a using a larger notion of small category with some sort of larger universe, or there are other ways of understanding this that even between locally small categories, one has exponential objects when the domain category is small. So once again, there are these pesky um, size issues behind this, but the mathematical underlying mathematical statement is correct. And now let's rub this off because I think that's a good place to put the second proposition that I want to state, which is again going to be another corollary of the Unada manner. This is the proposition two. Proposition two. Is the functor y is full and faithful. So we can see the Unada functor as embedding C in a way that's not really losing any information because the whole sets get preserved up to isomorphism. We've got essentially a copy of the category C in this functor category. Now that, that's very important. And that perspective is something that leads to a lot of applications in mathematics. So I'm going to, Look at that viewpoint later in the lecture. Come come back to that. 
And at the moment, we'll say this just as a technical statement the functor y is full and faithful. But again, this is going to be a corollary of the Yoneda lemma, a second corollary of the Yoneda lemma. Actually, in the sense, the first one, because we, we, we're going to derive this is a corollary, and then proposition one is going to be corollary of proposition two. So before stating the Yoneda lemma, I want to already give you one application of this corollary proposition too, um, which is rather simple. I mean, it's not a flagship application, so to speak, but it's um, because what I'm going to show you, one can perfectly well do without the Aneda lemma, but nonetheless, it's nice and it gives you some sort of feeling of the power of what's going on. Um, In both sides. Now, again, with you know, with applications, it's not subjects one looks at are not always to everyone's taste. So you can, you know, if there is not to your taste, then. Just uh, you can go to sleep for the next five minutes. But the application is going to concern groups. So let G be a group. Now we've got this functor, this Unida functor. Uh, proposition two tells us this Unida functor from is a functor from the category G. For the group G as a category, the full and faithful functor into the functor category from G op to set. So this is full and faithful. Or oh, as I've already told you before, sorry, not failful. That's not a word, but it sounds like it could be a word describing someone that fails a lot. Um, anyway, so this functor is fully faithful. We've, we've seen this. Um, and moreover, since G has only one object, because we've turned the group into a category with one object and all the, and the elements of the group as the isomorphisms, and the, which are the only morphisms, so as G has only one object, well, that means, so remember, the objects here are, are functors and the morphisms are natural transformations. But because this has only one object, each natural transformation has only one component. So it's basically just given by a function. So we have a forgetful functor from this to set given by u. We'll call it u, which is the functor that takes a natural transformation alpha to its it's a it's unique component, so it's component on the object star. Um, so that goes from to so this is the forgetful functor from the sorry from the functor category down to sets. This is obviously faithful because the natural transformation is given by this one component, which is a function. So if it's, you know, the functions will remain the two distinct natural transformations will give rise to two distinct functions. Um, it's faithful. And moreover, so we've got a composite functor, which is the, the composite of U and the Yoneda functor. And that takes us from G to set, and it's the composite of two faithful functors, so that's faithful. But every morphism in G is an isomorphism, and functors obviously preserve isomorphisms, 
So the image of this functor doesn't just land in G, so it doesn't just land in sets, it lands in the subcategory of sets where we only can consider the morphisms that are isomorphisms in set. The image of this, this functor, every, every map in the image of this functor is an isomorphism. Um, so because maps in G are iso, this actually gives a faithful functor on Tor, which I'll give the same name because it's the same functor, but it's a functor from G to category of sets with only isomorphisms of morphisms. So what's this doing? Well, this maps star to some set, the, the only object star to some set, and all morphisms here to isomorphisms on that set. So the isomorphisms on that set are bijections. So we've got a functor from G to, we can just take the single object that, that, that star gets mapped to, and we have then a group here whose who's, um, yeah, who's object is a set and whose morphisms are isomorphisms on the set. So in other words, this is, and remember, so we've got a functor, a faithful functor between two groups. Remember, any functor between groups as categories is the same thing as a homomorphism. So we have a group embedding of G into a symmetric group. So in other words, so this is IE and embedding G in a symmetric group. So I'm, I'm restricting just to the, the only object that we land on here. So what we've done is we've proved a famous, albeit simple theorem in group theory called Cayley's theorem, which somehow justifies the definition of a group, which is that every group embeds in a symmetric group. So we have proved Cayley's theorem. Okay, so it's a little application. We're proving only a very simple result. Um, so you might not be very, I mean, it's not so impressive, but it's, it's nice to see the connections between areas. The one thing I like about this is that this proof, I mean, the way I describe it is it works in ignorance. So this, the proof does what it, what it does. Um, so, but for the proof, works even without knowing what we're doing. So I mean, knowing what we're doing, well, you know, I mean, if one's knowing what's one, what, 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 what one's doing, one realizes that this functor category, like in the, I think it was the week three exercise, the functor category from G off to SAT, well, I put an off here, but in the week in the week three exercise, functor categories from G to set from a group G to set, you were supposed to realize that they correspond to the category of left G actions. Because we put an off here, it's right G actions. This is the category of right G actions. And then when we apply this functor. Sorry, which functor? This one, the Aneda functor to the object star, we get a particular action, and we don't need to know, although it's really what's underpinning this construction here, we don't need to know that y that the, the object y star is the transitive self-action, right action of G on itself. Transitive right action. If you're not even transitive right action, or at least on the end one, fraction of G on itself. So somehow these kind of facts are behind the scene, working behind the scenes, but they know where play a role in the proof. Now, time permitting, I'm going to come back to group actions as an example at the end of the lecture. Um, just 
a little bit interested how familiar people are with them. So hands up if you're sort of comfortable enough with G actions that this sort of thing is, is kind of comfortable to you. Yeah, okay, not, 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 not everyone, but almost everyone. Anyway, so with, with examples, as I said at the start of the course, one can sort of you know, take the example or leave it, and I'm trying to cover different areas. Um, okay, so it's, it's one minute before 11, but this seems a natural point to break, so I'll pause the recording. Okay, so in the half we had, in the first half we had two propositions that um, objects in an arbitrary category are determined by their generalized points, proposition one, and proposition two, that these representable functors that um, essentially encode generalized points, those are obtained by a functor itself, the Oneida functor, that is full and faithful. So the mapping from object of the category to representable functors is full and faithful. And these are both, as I've said, corollaries of the full Yoneda lemma. So it's now time to state the Yoneda lemma, which actually has a rather simple formulation. and uh, a very, very short proof. So the innate dilemma is for any functor as the same, of the same kind as the representable functor, so namely a contravariant functor from C to sets, and an object X of C as a bijection between natural transformations from, so if we consider the representable of X, that's another functor from C up to set. So we can consider the natural transformations from, from that representable functor into F. So that's the HOM objects in the, in the functor category. So this is the set of natural transformations from the nature of X, as, it, as we call it, to F. This is in bijection with F of X. Moreover, these bijections, as they always are in category theory, are natural. And in this case, in X, and also in F. So way of thinking about this, and not why to think why it's true, it's a bit hard to give an intuitive reason that it's true, at least I find it. If anyone's got any suggestions after the lecture, I'd be keen to hear them. You think about it with so F is an arbitrary functor of the contravariant functor of this kind. It is, so basically F is then a um F's a, a family of sets, one one for each object in here, um, with morphisms between these with with transition functions, if you like, between these sets corresponding to the morphisms in C. And we can recover these sets by considering, so, so rather than looking at the internal structure of the functor f, which is actually defined in terms of those sets, we can look at somehow the next external properties of it, which are maps into f, so generalized points of f in the functor category, that it's enough to restrict that um, for each object x here, we look at the generalized points in f, in f with the domain the representable for x. Um, so it's sort of turning the internal structure into external structure, if you like, in that direction and in the other direction, the opposite. Um, 
Okay, so let me outline the proof. So the required bijections Well, the more interesting one takes us from right to left. So here we take an, an element, um, I call it W in the notes. So we take an element W of, sorry, F of X, the set F of X. And we need to map it to a natural transformation from the representable for x to f. So such a natural transformation is going to be given by family of components indexed by z. And then for every z, the component's going to go from the representable for x at z, that's the home set in c from z to x. So we're going to take a map, what do I call it, f or g, little f, from z to x, and we need to map it, map it to something, we need to map it to an element of f of z. We have an element of f of x, we have a, a map little f from z to x. So because capital F is, um, is a contravariant functor, if we apply the functor, the, the um, Morphism action of capital of F to little f, we get a, a function from F of X to it's contravariant, we get a function from capital F of X to capital F of Z. And so we can simply apply that to W and we get back an element of F of Z. So we're simply applying the this contravariant action of functor F applied to the morphism little f to W. Okay. And in the other direction, we take such a natural transformation. We need to get back an element of f of x. Well, we can evaluate the natural transformation at its component. We can find the component of the natural transformation at x. So that's going to give us a, a function from y of x at x to f of x. The so y of x at x is the home set cxx. So we've got a canonical element of the home set from x to itself, namely the identity function. So we can simply apply alpha of x to the identity function, and we get back the element of f of x. And it works, so you need to verify that. So one verifies the sketch. This is the interesting part, giving the data. The verification, you just like work through the details. There's no insight required. So one verifies that these are mutually inverse. And um, and the, and the natural and that naturality holds. Okay. So once we've got that, we can immediately prove proposition two and proposition one. So we will do them in that order. Proposition two is the first corollary. So the proof of proposition two, which is still stated on the other board. So proposition two is that the functor y is full and faithful. So to prove this, we notice that the innate lemma gives us the y lemma gives us that the if we consider We consider the 
set of natural transformations from so the the later functor can terms the set of natural transformations out of representables to any other contravariant functor from C to set. So we can look at what's it. We can look at what the natural transformations are between as a special case between two representables, and the Unida the Unida lemma tells us that those are in bijection with um, the representable for Y. So that crucially evaluated as X because the representable for Y is the functor F in the um, in the Unida lemma. Well, this is by definition the Hobbs set CXY. So we've established that the natural transformations between representables are in bijection with the Hobbs set CXY. That's kind of full and faithful, except we need to check that this bijection in this direction is actually computed by the morphism action of the functor. So where the right to left so where the right to left bijection is, well, for this we actually look to the proof of the Nader lemma to see what the right to left bijection is. So that takes us from any morphism, any morphism in CXYW to this. So it gives us so G here is playing the role of the little W before. So this gets mapped to um, family components, which take a, a map F from Z to X to the result of computing the contravariant functors action on the morphism F applied to the morphism G. And when you go through the definitions, unsurprisingly, this gives us the gives us back a map from Z to X, so an element of um, an element of CZY, sorry, a map from Z to Y, and that's G composed with that. And this is exactly the action of which is the morphism action, morphism action of the data factor. Okay. Once you got proposition two. Proposition two says that the y functor um, from C into this property category is full and faithful. And we want to get proposition one, which is when we have an isomorphism between representables, then we get an isomorphism between the original objects. Can anyone see why this follows now? So we had something that we did earlier in the course, that any full and faithful functor reflects isomorphisms. So when, when you um, so if you have Is that the right word? Anyway, well, we did we did do this earlier in the course that if you have um, so I don't know why. Well, let me write down what I've written. Just a little doubt coming to my head, but it's, I'm sure it's. Just, I mean, not to doubt, but it's true. But I don't know I should say it like this. But anyway, let me write it down. And uh, I don't want to.
I mean, it's true that any color of the baseball puncture reflects isomorphisms, um, and it's true that the result that we want follows. I'm just wondering whether it's actually a slightly stronger than reflecting isomorphisms. What we need is that we've got two objects, and when we apply the full and faithful function to them, there is an isomorphism between them, then we have an isomorphism already between the two objects. I mean, that's, that, that's I think that's a bit stronger than reflecting isomorphisms, but it's still a property that holds of any full and faithful functor. Um, there may be the correct thing to write, and I'm sorry to be a bit confused about this, is um, sometimes when one's lecturing, one gets a, suddenly gets a doubt about how, how to properly express things. Um, it's in any case an easy consequence so let's just write an easy consequence of y being full and faithful. Because that's true. And you can, you can check that yourself if you've got a, a full and faithful functor between two categories. And Let's call it y for the sake of it, because we, we, we're dealing with y in this case. And if y of x and y of y are isomorphic, then x and y are isomorphic. And it's not a not at all a hard proof. Okay, so now we've got the innate dilemma. We've seen already, in a sense, two applications of it, namely these two little propositions. Um, I want to try to present to you the rest of the lecture the sort of bigger picture associated with it. And this is just going to be the start of, of this. And I'm going to do details for a few things, but not for everything. It's more important to get a feeling for, for the picture. So what we've got is um, I'm going to fade the notation now because I'm doing my notes, but also because I prefer this notation for, for small categories. So, so what we've got is we've got a small category C. So this is the notation I like for small categories, a sort of blackboard bold, as it's called. Um, the Yoneda functor gives as we've seen, a full and faithful embedding of any full and faithful functor we, we consider to be an embedding. Even it might identify some objects, but in a harmless way, in that any objects that get identified get, um, if they must have been isomorphic in the first place. I mean, actually, the Inada. A full and faithful functor in general might identify objects, the Inada lamina, the Inada functor never does. But let's just take that. Anyway, full and faithful embedding of the category C into the category, into this functor category, contravariant functors from C to C. And this is a very important category, if it has a name, it's called the category of free sheaves. sheaves or the category C. And it's called free sheaves because I mean this is a very fundamental construction. It looks the notion pre sounds like it should be less than something, but it's called that for historical reasons because mathematicians were before this category theory was developed were working with sheaves. And in fact one way of approaching sheaves is to look at functors of this kind satisfying some properties, some additional properties. Um, and now we're, here we're just looking at the category of all functors of this kind, irrespective of whether or not they satisfy some properties. So anyway, because of that, the less than being a sheep, because they don't have these additional properties. So now people talk about these as three sheaves, and that name has stuck. It's kind of a shame in a sense, because 
pre-sheaves are, you know, they're very good structures in their own right. There's nothing free about them in some sense. That they 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 deserve to, yes, they, they almost deserve to have the, uh, the the full name for themselves. Um, but in any case, people call them pre sheets. And um, this is a very important category. So the other so there are other standard notations for the category. So one sometimes writes just C with a hat on, but the category of pre-sheaves, one often sees that. Or well, something I pre prefer is to write C so as sort of short for the category of pre-sheaves. Okay. But in any case, when we write this, we mean the functor category of contravariant functors from C to SAT. So let's put it in the picture. So we start off with our small category C. We have this full and faithful functor, the Ineda functor. So the hook here means full and faithful. That's my note. That's the, I mean, that's just not a non standard notation, but people use the hook to mean different things in different circumstances. So you need to be careful with it. For any, can, any small category C, we can look at this larger category of pre sheaves then we have a, a copy of the category C living inside it. And what's nice here is that in the category of pre sheaves we have lots more structure potentially than we have in the category C. So we're kind of embedding the category C in a larger category that has more structure to play with that we can use to explore the category C. So what additional structure does this category have? Well, this category is complete, so it has all small limits. And as a remark, because C is a small category, it turns out it cannot be complete if it's not a pre-order. So the only small complete categories are pre-orders. Um, otherwise, if you have a small category, you can't have arbitrary limits. You could just take some large product over all their objects. So all the, you could you have a small category and product together all the objects in the category, and that cannot be an object of the category for cardinality reasons, essentially. But there's an argument to that effect in the in the claims book, categories for the working mathematician. It's also co-complete, so it has all small it has all small co-limits, co-complete. In addition, this category, this functor category, is automatically Cartesian closed. So there's a function space with respect to the product, um, the noble structure. And even more than this, it's what's called a, a topos. Indeed, a special kind of topos called the Grotendick topos. And this means it's got a lot of very good properties, exactly the properties that say that co-limits co behave in very good ways in, in general. Um, and uh, topos also means you can view it as a sort of like a category of sets in some sense. Okay, so one gets all this additional structure. So one could embed the category C or the small category. Some category that involves a lot of a lot more structure. And moreover, this functor Y, this preserves let's bring the arrow to the middle. This preserves limits. So C doesn't have all limits, but it preserves existing limits. Just as a warning, doesn't preserve co-limits. Co-limits. And um, we'll come back to this point because as we're going to see next week, we can actually view this category as, a, as being constructed in a very canonical way from C as 
adding co-limits to C. And if, and if C has existing co-limits, you add three versions of the code, you, you destroy the old co-limits and add new ones. So this category, this category of pre-sheets we'll see next week can be viewed as freely adding co-limits to the category C. And so actually this functor here basically almost never preserves co-limits. It only preserves co-limits if they're absolute in the sense of the notes of last week's lecture. So if, um, I didn't actually cover it in the lecture, if it only preserves those co-limits that all functors preserve. But anyway, let's not worry about such more exotic things for the moment. The important thing is that it's preserved limits, but it doesn't preserve co-limits, and that this category of pre-sheets has all this additional structure. So what I want to look at a little bit is how this additional structure arises on the category of pre-sheets. Um, I'm only going to look at a few choice points. So let's do limits and co-limits. In fact, those are easy. And they're constructed in the same way, basically, as each other. Well, I mean, limits are not the same as co-limits, but you do the same thing. You basically use limits and co-limits in the category of, of sets. So the, the way one describes this mathematically are that limits and co-limits in category of pre-sheaves are constructed let's put limits straight care limits are constructed pointwise using limits or co limits respectively in the category of sets. So to construct a given kind of limit, say product in pre-sheaves, we use product in set pointwise. Um, and I'll show you what that means in a moment. To construct a given co-limit, say co-equalizers in pre-sheaves, you use co-equalizers in sets. And again, you do this pointwise. So what does pointwise mean? Well. I'll illustrate that using the case of binary product, which is kind of very simple, obviously very simple notion of limit. Um, so, so illustration binary product. So suppose Suppose F and G are pre sheaves. So we need to define the pre sheaf F product with G. So let's define this. So this needs to be a pre sheaf so it's a contravariant functor from the category of C to the category of sets. So we need to say what to do with, again, I'll just check the notation. We need to say how we map an object and a morphism in the category of C. Because it's contravariant, we'll draw the, the morphism going up. So such a morphism, ah, oh, hang on. Yeah. So the way this is, the, the fact that it's constructed pointwise means that for each object X, we use the product, we use the corresponding limit, in this case, the product of the sets Fx and Gx in the category of sets. So we simply map X to fx tie product with gx. 
So x prime accordingly gets mapped to fx prime product with gx prime. And now we need to find a Now we need to find a morphism here, which is um, which is going to be a, function, a set theoretic function from fx times gx to fx prime times gx prime. But of course, we've got a, a function from fx to fx prime given by applying the contravariant function f, capital F to a morphism little f. We have a con we have a function from gx to gx prime given by applying a contravariant function to g. To the morphism f. And that's and the product of those two functions gives us the function here. Okay, so to point twice means just using for each object x that structure in the category of sets, and using and doing so gives us the morphisms between between the, the required the required morphism action of the functor. Okay, so that's the case of limits. So we've already dealt with limits and co-limits, so complete and co-complete. That's all I'm going to, to say about limits and co-limits for now. Gross and Victopos, well, that's more advanced. We might get to that at the end of the course. I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to, which way I'm going to go for the last lectures. But Cartesian closed, that's something we've dealt with already in, in lectures. So let's look at the Cartesian closed structure of base shapes. And this is a nice little construction that's not pointwise. We don't use pointwise function spaces in a set. It's more elaborate than that. So this is actually, I, I'm calling it a theorem. And I think this is not even in McLean. I don't know. I'm not sure. The, I'm not sure whether it's in categories for the working but mathematician. So I haven't checked which of the textbooks it's in. It's definitely in the book of McLean and Mordike, the more advanced book that I've put in the literature for the course. Um, but it's probably in, um, it's, it's, it must be in some of the other basic textbooks too. And I'm not going to give the full details of this, because the full details are quite long. But the idea is not so long, and it's quite illuminating in terms of giving a good example of how one should think about pre-sheaves. So the theorem is that the category pre-sheaves is Cartesian closed. Again, this is a proof outline. So given three sheaves F and G, we need to construct a three sheaf which I'll write the square brackets way as I was doing earlier in the course. So namely a free sheaf that sort of represents the morph the function space from F to G, the, the set of morphisms from F to G, so to speak. And rather than just giving the definition, the illuminating way to do is to do a little calculation to understand why the definition is going to work. So to do that, we, to begin with, assume such a, an exponential object exists, and we're going to explore some of its properties. So, but if such an object exists, such a pre-sheaf exists, let's, let's be precise what we mean by object, if such a pre-sheaf exists, it must enjoy the following properties. So 
is it's a contravariant functor, so we can apply it to an object X. But by the innate dilemma, set of elements in any contravariant functor is in one-to-one -one correspondence with natural transformations from the innate of X into this functor. So this is in one-to-one -one correspondence with maps in three sheet of C, that's natural transformations from the innate of X into uh, G. So here we're not applying one of the corollaries of the innate dilemma, we're applying the full innate dilemma here. So this is the innate dilemma. So Y L is so an isomorphism. But now, here we're looking at the home set in the category C of consistent looking at maps from an object Y of X into a function space. And maps in a Cartesian closed category into a function space. Remember, we have this currying, uncurrying idea that maps into a function space are the same as maps out of a product space into the co-domain of the function space. So this is, by the Cartesian closed structure, this is a one-to-one -one correspondence with maps in the pre-sheet category from the product object into G. Okay. This was, a, this was the adjunction that gave rise to um, okay. So, so this is Cartesian closed structure. So Cartesian closed structure. So here, this little calculation is saying these must hold if the category is Cartesian closed, and we write, and this is the ex the exponential object. We must have these isomorphisms. We haven't yet shown that it is Cartesian closed, and we have such a thing. So given that, but given this, we use this. As a as as our definition of the function space, the right hand, this right hand set here, the set of natural transformations from this functor to this, makes sense. Anyway, we don't need anything to interpret this. We simply understand it. This is the, this set of natural transformations. So we're going to use this to define this pre-sheet. So given this. define F, G, sorry, I'm right at the bottom of the board. We're simply going to turn the this whole sort of, this chain of two bijections into a definition of an equality. This is simply going to be, define this to be the set of natural transformations, which is a set because C is small, and so the um, category appreciated is locally small. Functor category is locally small. The product, so from the product functor, the nature of X, the representable for X times F, into the functor G. And then the last bit of the proof, let's put it in this little corner. And we check that this works. And this, I'm afraid, involves quite a bit of calculation. So, um, I mean, there's nothing hard in it. Again, you know, the, the, the hard thing, in a sense, conceptually, is to find the right definition. Then there's the question, how does one think about this? Well, uh, I mean, one could talk for a... It's, it's actually quite important when one works with these things to develop intuition for them and to have ways of thinking about them. Um, but it would be premature to, for me to, you know, one needs to get a bit of working experience and then at that point one can start to talk about, about a, a bit more, I think, about, about the intuition. Um, so what I want to end with, we've got five minutes, is a worked example of this property. So the point is, now we've got a way, of, we can understand that this definition, at least on um, 
you know, one that extends this to a fun, it's not difficult to give the functorial action here. It is a bit more difficult to check, to check that it works. Um, so we now have a construction of these function spaces in any pre sheaf category, in any of these functor categories. So actually, this allows you to answer the week seven, I think it was, exercise that was, what are the function spaces in the functor category from groups to sets, from a group object to set, and in the functor category from um, this little category that gives rise to essentially graphs as the elements of the functor category. So I've just considered the first one, so we're going to go back to group actions now. So, so an example, this is answering the week seven exercise. Function spaces in three sheets on, on the group, on the category for a group, G a group. So I did ask the question about how familiar you are with group actions earlier, because the earlier calculation was somehow straightforward. And now we're going to a little bit use more involved reasoning about group actions, very, very slightly. So, so we have an answer to the week three exercise. I've already written it today. So this is the pre sheaves over the G uh, isomorphic to the category of right G actions, because well, that was the, the solution to the week three puzzle, except week three was left G actions, because we didn't have the, currently we're considering covariant functors rather than contravariant functors. So let's now calculate the functor space, the, sorry, the function space for two pre sheaves. So that, I'll, I'll underline them, A and B, the three sheaves corresponding to actions that's called the bullet A and B bullet B, so the right action. Different sense. Can be this has got the two different sets, yeah. Because so the, the actions are a set together with a group action of it, yeah. So you might call it the category of right G sets, if you like. Um, people often do. So we calculate the function space A B in. And the pre-sheaves of G. So this fun function space here, well, it's a pre-sheaf, so it's a functor from G to G op to sets. Um, but because G op only has one object, there's only sort of one interesting place to look at it, which is on the object star. And by well, by the definition, this is, by what we've just defined, this is the same thing as the functors from the natural transformations. Let's not put the brackets there. So here I'm simply using this formula at the bottom, except I've inverted the product just because it's more natural later, but obviously product symmetric, so it doesn't matter what order we, we put this product in. Um, so this is by previous page. So that's, so as per definition. But using the, the equivalence of three sheaves with G actions, this is the same thing as um, G, I'm going to write the category as G act sub R for right G actions. 
from, well, this is from the action A, product action with, well, what is Y of star? Well, I already told you that. It is the group G with its transitive right action on itself to the action B. So, so this is G with the right self action. I don't quite know whether to hyphenate those. Um, and this, astonishingly, is isomorphic. So this should be isomorphic here. This is isomorphic to simply the function space of all functions from A to B. All functions from A to B. Right, it's, it's 12 o'clock. It's a very short argument. I just want to show you why this last why this last isomorphism comes from. Why on earth are Morphisms of G actions that equivariant maps of this form in one to one correspondence with arbitrary functions from A to B. Hands up if you've seen this before, this fact. Okay, just a couple of people. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not totally obvious. You just, you, need, you just need to prove it. So, so given any function, F from A to B, we're going to define, I'll call it F twiddles, a function from A times G to B, which is F twiddles applied to the pair AG. Is, you define that to be F twiddles of A acted on by g to the minus one. So g is an element of the group, so it's the inverse, or this is the right action, this is the A right action, and then the whole thing from the B right action you apply g for. And it's very important that g to the minus one here and g here, not, not, the, other, not the other way around. Um, and then exercise, F twiddles is equivariant and the mapping F to F twiddles is a bijection from arbitrary functions from B to the A to equivariant maps. From A times G to B. But this is the crucial definition you need. And after that, you can you can verify the rest. So the, the exponential in In G on the set, that's species over G, is function space in set plus an appropriate action. Which you can derive rather straightforwardly from what I've already told you. So I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what the action is, or you can you can look it up on Wikipedia if you look to Cartesian closed category, then G sets are one of the examples. Maybe they do the left ones, but anyway, you can easily turn it around. So 
It's an ex exercise to calculate the action from this. But the point that I wanted to show was how one derives this function space construction as an instance of this general of this general construction of function spaces in the category of pre-sheaves. Um, and these things are not really difficult, but they are a bit involved and it does take a bit of getting used to. So as an exercise for you, now this machinery is available, you should revisit the week seven puzzle and for yourself, work out what the function space is in the category of quivers or graphs, as it were, which is the other functor category that was involved in the week seven puzzle. Okay, that's everything for today. I'm going to um, stop the recording.